Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm David L. Ulan, the books editor of Alta Journal, and I want to welcome you to tonight's edition of the California Book Club. Um, we will be uh, hearing Hua Xu discuss his Pulitzer Prize winning memoir, Stay True, uh, in conversation with California Book Club host John Freeman and our special guest for this evening, Jose Vadi. Um, before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Alta California Book Club and our partners. Uh, Alta is a quarterly print publication with a, an active website. We do uh, we cover California history, California culture, uh, California life, or the life of the West, uh, with a big focus on Western literature, um, which, as you all know, if you've been here before, we think of as the centerpiece of contemporary uh, American literature. Um, and, and the California Book Club is a is a is a is is an expression of this. It's a. Uh, it grew out of a, an essay by John Freeman that ran in Alta a couple of years ago. And every month we um, have a conversation with uh, a different California writer uh, about their about their work. Um, our partners include Book Passage, Book Soup, Books Inc., Bookshop, Bookshop West Portal, Diesel, a bookstore, Green Apple Books. The Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Romans Bookstore, and Ziziva Magazine. Um, I you will uh, sorry. Um, so uh, our monthly events and continuous content leading up to each book club meeting are always free. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read this material, you'll definitely want to. Don't miss essays from talented contributors with reflections uh, on tonight's work. There's an excerpt to Stay True and more. All of this is also included in our weekly California Book Club newsletter, also free, so please sign up. Um, and if you want to know how you can support the work we're doing, bringing in-depth articles, essays, and interviews with authors and poets to you, you can simply join Alta as a digital member for only $3 a month, or you can become an official member of Alta Journal, and for $50, get a year of Alta Journal, the California Book Club hat, and Alta's Guide to the Best Bookstores in the West, which is the first book that we have published um, at Alta. Um, you can find that offer at altaonline.com slash join. Uh, I'm very excited about tonight's uh, events. Fantastic book. Um, so without any further ado, please let me introduce John Freeman, who will introduce Washu and begin the conversation. John, take it away. Thanks, David. Good to see everybody and to have all of you here on this Zoom call to talk about this glorious new work, uh, Stay True, winner of the Pulitzer Prize by Hua Xu. In 2017, Hua Xu wrote a piece for The Believer, which began, I used to live by a simple philosophy, keep everything. It's a funny piece about how to get rid of your CDs. But in many ways, the piece is a gateway to some of the big issues at, at heart in his memoir, Stay True. For the early parts of the 20, 2000s, Washu was an indispensable voice of critical culture when it came to listening to music, to reading books, to watching films. If you cared about the crack cocaine nostalgia that was creeping into modern day hip hop, if you wanted to read a great profile of Maxine Hong Kingston, Washu was your guy. Uh, but obviously, over those many years, he was thinking about something that, that happened to him in college, which he writes about in Stay True, which is one of the most glorious books about friendship. It's an elegy to a friend. It's a anthem to lo-fi music collecting and fandom. Um, it's a story about being Asian American in California and in America in a certain time. It's a kind of immigrant love story um, to growing up. It is a glorious book full of so many quotable sentences. I could just sit here for the next 52 minutes and quote them to you. But just a few of them are worth uh, saying because they land in this book, which proceeds in loops um, as it as we follow Washu. Um, into Berkeley, into the University of California at Berkeley, where he's going to school and make some friends. Back then, he writes, there was no such thing as spending too much time in the car. Or when he was talking about growing up in California, the son of Taiwanese immigrants, his father, an engineer, he writes, the first generation 
thinks about survival. The ones that follow tell the stories. He also writes about becoming friends with people who are beginning to realize that their lives are not represented in culture. And so he says, we sought a modest kind of infamy. Sentence after sentence of this book pour out in the most elegant and controlled fashion. Um, I can't describe to you how many realizations I had grow, uh, reading it about what it was like to grow up in California in around the same time. And I suspect everyone else who has read this book feels the same way. It's a huge pleasure to have him here. Watch you join us on the California Book Club. Hey, everyone. Uh... Wow, John, thanks for that just spectacular introduction. And thanks to the other John, David, Blaze, Beth, and everyone at Alta, the California Book Club, for making this happen. Thanks to all the indie bookstores who've been a part of this as well. It's a, it's a real honor and treat to be here. Um, although I feel very weird because I'm on the East Coast right now, and I know it's around 5 p.m. there. So um, I wish I wish it were, I wish it was 5 p.m. in California here, but unfortunately it's... 8 p.m. and gross in New York City. So, yeah, one of my favorite uh, small moments, of which there are dozens and dozens in this book, is when you describe someone going back east. And I thought, this is a California book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just never understood what uh, what the what that could possibly mean. Uh, it just seemed like not a place that I was returning to. Um, but no, it's just so so awesome to be here. So let's let's dive right in. I mean, this is there's so many books within this book. It it and yet it feels so loose and elegant and comfortable in its clothing. Um, you spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, working as a cultural critic. And you, um, how did you find the, the voice for this particular um, project? Uh, because it feels so um, natural, and yet I I can't imagine it came easy. Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, as you noted before, um, I've written a lot of like cultural criticism, a lot of journalism over the years, and that's just sort of the the main sort of vocation I saw. Like I always knew in the back of my head that I wanted to return to these stories of myself and my friend Ken and just our little cohort of of, of people we grew up with. But I was never really, I guess, generationally, I just wasn't as comfortable writing about myself like I think that I'm 46 like I think when I was in my 20s there just weren't really models for people who wanted to kind of write their own stories in ways that I think there are more models available to young readers and writers now so uh, you know throughout that period of time when I was writing about like profiling folks or you know you mentioned the how-to guide for how to get rid of your old cds like in the back of my mind, I knew that it was a problem of language that I had to acquire. And I saw a lot of the journalism as practice. I wasn't sure how to implement it, but I kind of understood that like, if, if I can't describe how this guitar sounds, or if I can't describe how this book makes me feel, that it would be very difficult to write about like friendship or relationships and things like that. So um yeah, I just it took me a lot of trial and error to figure out how to how to actually approach it. You're describing these these years, um, the very early parts of the book. Uh, it's you describe growing up your your parents, how they met in Illinois, and you say, you know, they're both grad students, and you say in the 1960s, um, students throughout the the Chinese speaking world found themselves it found each other in one of these small sort of midwestern towns and it was like a little microcosm to your own story because you're this story is about you and and and, and some friends some of whom are asian american finding yourself in a slightly bigger college town in the in the 1980s and 90s yeah and 90s um you know were those parallels something that you were thinking about as you began to tell this story it sounds weird because you know uh your, your previous question about the writing I had done before sort of leading to this, it felt like there are these very discrete differences, how I approached writing as a journalist or as a someone under with an assignment. Like when I'm writing a book review or a profile, I kind of always know how it's going to begin and end. Uh, like I'm very rigorous about structure. But with this, I didn't 
really know what I was doing. Like I just sort of started writing pages and pages. And as a result, like I didn't make a lot of connections until I wrote them down. Like they, they're, it, it's not as though I, I recognized anything profound about my parents until I actually sat down to write these sections or to go through, you know, these old, uh, sold ephemera that we still had. Um, so it was a very different approach to writing and one that I think other writers are more comfortable doing, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of like using writing as this exploration. That's just not how I usually work. And so, uh, no, I, I didn't really make a lot of those connections until I actually sat down to to think about them and to, to write about the past and to to sort of find my own structure in this story. So much of it is about intimacy on many different levels. We'll get very shortly to, you know, you going to Berkeley and meeting your friend Ken and some of your other roommates. But, you know, the, the I was immediately touched by your descriptions of your relationship with your parents, you know, spending a lot of time alone with your mother while your father was in Taiwan, <laughs> conducting your relationship with your father while he went back to Taiwan to, to work by fax, yeah. which sounds like the opposite of an intimate relationship, but yet... <laughs> He managed, it sounds like, through your quotations to 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 conduct one. And I, I wonder if you can just tell us a little, a little bit more about that and what what that prepared you for as a young man growing up when your your sort of model of of intimacy was conducted interrogatorily through a fax. Yeah. yeah, I mean again, there's it's it's really a sense of awareness or an empathy that I uh, gained throughout this process. Uh, like I write in the book, and I think as anyone would imagine, like when you're actually a teenager, you're not thinking about um, meaning, you know, or uh, legacy or uh, empathy. Like you're very just focused on your own world. And so, you know, in the moment, faxing with my dad was just kind of a chore. And not only is it not intimate to, uh, you know, exchange these like sort of letters that aren't really letters be, I mean it was weird to not even be I remember thinking like it's weird that I can't even see the indentation of the pen because it's sort of like a washed out Xerox that you get on the other side of a fax machine um, so I never saw it as I saw it as this kind of strange attempt at intimacy but I was a teenager so I didn't actually want it and I didn't actually um think about it very deeply. I was, I was very just perfunctory. Like this is the math homework I need you to help me with. These are the bands I'm into. Uh, I'll write you again if next time there's an earthquake or, or some, some sort of like big news on this side of the side of things. Um, but a lot of the insights, you know, like, and, and a lot of the insights in the latter half of the book around friendship and around um, I think the impact that my friends had on me, I could never articulate them until I actually just sat down to write them. And, and so it's, it was a very strange process for me to actually just sit there and try and work out and, and piece together what these patterns actually meant in retrospect. Mm. It was remarkable um, to, to see your father giving you advice about Kurt Cobain's suicide yeah. <laughs> in a fax machine. And I, I think there are some listeners who probably can place themselves exactly where they were when they learned that Kurt Cobain had died, but they can also, like you, place themselves exactly where they were when they heard, first heard a song by Nirvana, especially Smells Like Teen Spirit. Um, I, I, I wonder, you know, before we talk, get, get you to read a little bit from the book and bring us into the, the, the period when you're at Berkeley, maybe, um, what, what sort of happened to you when you heard that song? I mean, what, what was different from it than the music that your father had been collecting and listening to on his hi-fi? Uh, you know, my dad, my dad was really into music. I mean, he's still into music, just not with any of the energy that, you know, he had back then. And I think the idea of finding something that I liked that he had no I mean, it's weird because I think, I guess people learn about new music through the radio or through their friends or through magazines, but I feel like I learned a lot just from watching my parents listen to music. So the idea of finding something that they weren't aware of, but also like 
people at school weren't aware of. It just felt like this secret. Obviously, you know, like, like literally billions of people like Nirvana. So it's not as though I was so far ahead of the curve. But I think, you know, the 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 cohort of people who had that moment, we all took it with us into our lives and, you know, were influenced it in different ways. Like some people started bands, some people got into even more obscure music, some people you know, got into Pearl Jam, some people like took that ethos into their lives as writers or filmmakers or other things. And so I think there was something about the spirit of seeing something that I felt was like new and unprecedented. Of course I was 13, so you know, I was I didn't really have a full grasp of history, but every 13 year old has that relationship with something I would think. And for me, it just happened to be something that like hundreds of millions of 13 year olds soon <laughs> fell, uh, fell under the spell of as well. And so, um, I mean, I'm not even sure I listen to Nirvana that much anymore, but I still think a lot about being this like wide eyed teenager and thinking like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Or, or that's, that's really cool that this happened and um, sort of, living through that moment is something that I hold on to possibly more than the music itself. If that makes sense. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's many different reasons for the title stay true, um, which we'll get to in a, in a, in a second, but the, the thing the book does so beautifully consistently is describe what it feels like to experience something um, rather than describe what it feels like to analyze and find the pattern in the experience. And, and perhaps that, and uh, one of the listeners, Alicia Yi, says, you know, things gain a meaning when we try to assign meaning, but only in hindsight. And yeah, totally. As a writing philosophy, stay true is, is sort of um, it, it goes deep, but there's obviously some very more personal reasons for that title. I, I wonder how you want to introduce. Can I just that? say I something really quick about what you just said. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think what you just described is one of the difficulties that I had to figure out for myself because I, I have been working as a music critic for so long. So I think I was approaching things very analytically, but I've never thought of myself as like a very polemical or like a, like a critic with really strong opinions. I've always just been more enchanted with like the effect that something has on me or what it makes us imagine or what it makes us desire and so the idea of writing about a band that's as kind of ubiquitous as nirvana <laughs> was very daunting because it's like millions of words have been written about this band but i think what i wanted to share with the reader was just uh and and throughout the book like i don't name as many things as i could have named like there are a lot of stores that i describe but i don't name them there are a lot of pieces of music that I described, I don't name, because I wanted the reader to be able to then kind of share in that experience of discovery or share in that experience of awe, rather than feeling like I was forcing my own awe on them, if that makes sense. And so figuring out that distinction between like analysis and experience that you just touched on was, uh, that was really important for me. Well, you've You've done it beautifully because, uh, you know, the book has references to Bismarcky and Pavement, uh, <laughs> among many other bands, but right. it's, but it, it is very restrained for a book written by someone who at the time um, would say things like, uh, in those days, I fixated on the lamest things people did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it feels like, or um, you, you build yourself, you build a world by the things that you buy, um, you know, these the 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 assemblage of a personality a persona an aesthetic is is a deep part of the book and yet as you just mentioned you're not sort of shoving your references at us it's it's more the activity of that assemblage that comes through yeah and i think every generation every micro generation has a version of that experience even if the infrastructure is like completely different you know and i, I just wanted to uh, having taught college students for the past 15, 20 years, like I didn't want to kind of force my sense of nostalgic yearning onto a reader. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to alert them to, you know, their own relationship with the past too. Um, so. That's right. 
Well, do you think you could maybe read a, a short section of the book for us? Sure. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, as John mentioned, uh, I went to Berkeley, as I'm sure like a few dozen people <laughs> in the chat did as well. Um, and this is a part in the book where a bunch of friends and I um, have decided to try and get to the roof of our dormitory. We were on the roof of our dorm just after dinner, waiting for the sunset. It was late May, the beginnings of t-shirt and shorts weather, though I opted for a striped wool sweater I'd recently thrifted. Finding our way to the summit of Ida Sproul Hall was a final curiosity satisfied before moving out. Soon we'd be sophomores living off campus, dispersed throughout Berkeley, maybe Oakland. There were rumors of some juniors who lived all the way in San Francisco. We might need bikes, maybe even a car to see one another. Does the bus stop there? We looped our cameras around our necks and took turns climbing up the service ladder. The light felt rich with possibility. You wanted to believe there was no better time or place on earth than this right now. It was a bunch of us from the third and fourth floors, as well as Anthony, who lived in a different dorm, but never passed up the chance for adventure. We took pictures of one another, all these random group shots of not quite friends. We were now joined by this moment, since we would all be in trouble if anyone found us up here. From 10 floors up, the clock tower looked close enough to reach out and touch, and the campus, which seemed vast and unknowable, came into view as a unified whole. The sun was setting. You realize how haphazard this place was, these lecture halls, offices, laboratories, meadows, dormitories, climbing a hill until they could go no further. I have a picture of Ken. His elbows rest on the ledge. He's looking up from his camera toward the San Francisco Bay. Maybe he looks past it. and Maybe he's wondering where in this wide open space he will land. I have a photo only of him looking, not what he is looking at. Thanks. That's a beautiful passage for so many reasons, the way that you describe the sort of almost floating suspended state that you're in up above the campus. And it highlights something that this book has, um, which are pictures throughout um, the, the, that the, a picture from that um, that dangerous climb is on the cover of the book. And then there are pictures in between chapters that are not um, captioned. And I wonder if you can talk about that, because it is uh, is the style of the picture a throwback to, to zines? Is it just a, a way that you wanted the, the readers to be strobed? Yeah, I it did. It does try and call back to the culture of like making zines or these, you know, just sort of uh, re, like reappropriated images, allowing the reader um, some sort of sense of like putting stuff back together. Uh, the, and I liked the idea that the images are also the only actual kind of dividers, like the chapters aren't numbered or named. Uh, I began to think of it sort of like you're walking down a hallway, peeking into different people's dorm rooms and you just sort of get a glimpse of their life, but you don't actually uh, you know, you might see the posters on their walls or sort of what they're doing, but you don't really know these people, but you sort of understand the scene based on this sort of quick, um, quick passage. And so I, I kind of wanted the images to feel that way, like they sort of attest to the existence of memory without fleshing out what those memories were, because so much of the book is about memory and the faultiness of memory and and things that we may misremember, even if there's like photographic evidence of these things. Mm. Yeah, you introduce Ken and then reintroduce him um, almost immediately saying, well, actually the first time I met him, um, which is a, sort of a stutter step in the remembrance reel. Um, for those who haven't read the book, um, uh, what, what would you say was immediately striking about him um, now having read the book? Would, would, I mean, not now having written the book, do you think that changed versus before you wrote it? My sense of the initial encounter or? Yeah. Yeah, I think, but I think, uh, so um, if, if it isn't already obvious um, for those who haven't read the book, 
I was very much the type of person. Yeah. I mean, John read the quote about how I would always judge people on the quote lamest thing they ever did. So I was very much enamored with my own sense of like singularity and taste. And I was definitely the college kid who, uh, when we all went to the video store to rent a video, would want to get some sort of like obscure foreign film or something, you know? So I think when I went to college, as many people do, I think I was just looking for people who were exactly like me, who had the same sense of very refined sort of alternative taste. And the first time I met Ken, I just didn't think he was alternative enough for me, which is a judgment I levied on like, you know, tons of people I met. But there was just something about his sense of confidence, which you know, I, I later sort of under, understood more that I thought like, this is so not my person. Like, this is not, we are not people. We are not each other's people. Um, and over time, I just realized that he actually was an open-minded person and I was not. And I think the revelation or, or the sense of um, kind of revisiting my initial understanding of him versus sort of like actually spending time with him. I think I always sort of understood that I'd completely misread him and that I tend to be sort of uh, kind of overly, jud or I, at the time it was like way more judgmental than I needed to be about very kind, open-hearted people. Um, and writing the book, I think what ends up happening is there's probably a bit more of a sense of like, I am the caricature, like I am the joke. I am the person getting dunked on throughout the book because I look back and I just think about how, uh, like I was thinking earlier today about how, um, I, about how one of my affectations was that I claim professed to be like a love, like I loved eggplant because eggplant seemed like such an unloved, like, like alternative thing to be into. But like, I, I had no idea how to cook it or eat it or anything, but it was just sort of like in the assemblage of my own personality, I was just like into things that other people weren't into. Uh, this, this sounds so, so ridiculous now, but, um, and he was just this confidence per, confident person who did not need to put up those sorts of errors. And he sort of immediately recognized that about me, but would also take seriously my passions for like the music I was into or or my clothes. And that was, um, you know, I, I learned so much just by his desire to ask me questions about why I was the way I was. Um, it's kind of a rambling answer, but. No, that's a, it's a really lovely one. Um, a question had came in before the event by Derek Liu, and he said, it's, it's been a long time since I so was so moved by a work of literature. And I'm really fascinated by this dichotomy in Asian American masculinity that you draw between yourself and Ken, the pessimistic hipster killjoy a la Sarah Ahmed, and the well-adjusted <laughs> optimistic guy. And he, he says, to what extent do you feel like these roles are still available to Asian American men today? That's a really good question. Um, I think where I was going before was that in the writing, the the sort of division probably feels much starker than it did in youth, you know, because like when you're young, things matter, but you're also, you know, you're spending so much time with each other, you sort of take for granted that you're going to like kind of merge into these like, you know, um, that you're going to like find these like moments of synchronicity as well. Um, and so in the book, I think, I am the sort of the caricature of that incredibly negative uh, intellectual hipster type. Um, and he certainly was a more like optimistic and hopeful person than I was. Uh, I think that these stereotypes, I think these archetypes are still available to Asian Americans are still available to all of us. They probably just look a bit different because the, the outcomes and the futures we can imagine are just so different than they were in like 1996 or 1997. I mean, I went to college at the sort of dawn of kind of uh, what, I mean, like the idea of multiculturalism was still quite uh, exciting. There's still some sense of um, 
it was still like a very progressive vision, I would say, right, in the, in the mid-1990s. Um, there are a lot of aspects of culture or politics that just probably feel more closed off to a college student than they did in like 1996. And so I think the this like swing between being like hopeful and optimistic or being uh, sort of like a killjoy, uh, I'm sure this dynamic plays out in dorm rooms all over the world all the time. It's just that they, they're sort of tracked to different rhythms now or different possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to bring in um, our guest, Jose Vade, who's the author of Interstate Essays from California, which is forthcoming from Soft Skull, um, who will have some further questions for you. And I feel like it's also a good opportunity to talk about um, certain aspects of the, the Californianness of this book. Um, Jose has been lurking in the audience patiently. Um, Jose, could you join us now from Sacramento or Sacramento, as we say? Yes, yes. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Wa. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, last time we saw each other was at Green Apple Books, a yeah. proud uh, flagship of the California Book Club, which is my lovely segue into my first question, which is about community. Um, you know, putting out this book, you know, you got to be kind of like an event producer for a little bit there. You know, you had like events in New York with Lucy Sant, you had a pickup basketball game in China. <laughs> you had a Pearl Jam cover band called Earth Dad, you know, involved in all this. You had someone commissioning rave flyers for your website, as well as like, and you also made a zine that kind of was almost the original idea for Stay True. Like, yeah. I feel like all that stuff kind of created or extended the community that was originally depicted in Stay True. Was that a goal? Am I crazy in believing that? Or, and, and also, like, how did it feel just putting on all these events? Uh, it, was very, it was very special to be able to, um, you know, like during COVID, a lot of people who wrote books just didn't have the opportunity to do live events. So the, the idea of being able to do it, anything was a privilege. The fact that people came to these events um, was really special, which is why I tried to make each one a little bit different, uh, whether it was like getting completely different types of interlocutors. Uh, yeah, I had this like great cover band, this, this, this band Earth Dad. It's actually up on Bandcamp now. If anyone wants to listen to it, I'll drop the link in the chat. But um, yeah, they covered like 90s alt rock in a sort of ambient fashion at my book launch. Uh, I made these zines. I think the impetus was as I was editing my book, I, I had this like dissociative relationship to the people in the book. Like even though it's very intimate, uh, like I was just saying with John, like I see myself as an 18 year old as a bit of a caricature, you know, like I look back and I think like, oh, I should have just been like more open or more earnest or whatnot. But, and so like, I don't feel like an intimate connection, but I feel like a fondness for all the people in the book because the book was a chance to like hang out a bit longer. You know, it was a chance to just observe and create this world and see the people in this world move around without, without my um, puppet strings. And as I was reading, rereading and editing those sections of the book, I was just reminded of how much time I used to spend just like making stuff, making zines, making posters, making flyers, and just how it made the world seem so big and also so small. And so I think it was just me wanting to feel that again. Um, and that's why uh, the book launch last year, if any of you came to events or, um, Read about any of the events, like I, I, I liked doing those things, like making t-shirts or making zines, because it just sort of expanded the community of people who I think could feel part of the world of the book, if that makes sense, uh, beyond the sort of people who are actually in the book. And so, yeah, it just was like, I was reading about making my old zines, like, man, I used to have so much fun doing this. I could just do it again now. And um yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of where that all came about. One thing I did not do, and this is sort of like a clumsy way to plug your forthcoming book, uh, Chipped, yeah. is that <laughs> uh, 
Jose has this really excellent book of um, essays about skateboarding coming out. Is it coming out later this year? Uh, early next year, yeah. Okay. Um, everyone check it out. It's it's awesome. Um, but I write a lot about like skating and like more athletic endeavors. And as I was reading those, I was like, oh, yeah, that's uh, oh to be young. Oh, to have once been young. Um, there are certain things that I read about and I'm like, I do not stay out all night and skate and do all these things anymore so <laughs> oh man i don't want to be a bad encouragement but uh, <laughs> the streets are out there so uh well do you still write like the rapper ludicrous you know like in the lucy song interview you were talking about how ludicrous writes on his dashboard during car commutes and given your inaugural semester at fall <laughs> I feel like Nardwar right now, given your inaugural like semester at Bard and stuff, I, I assume the commutes are getting longer. Are you ludicrous still on the same kind of prose workshop level? I don't know the I don't know the status of Lud Luda's pen game right now. Like I'm not sure if he's actually uh, he, the story is that he used to be a radio promo guy and he'd be driving around and he would just write his verses on a notebook that was like attached to his steering wheel. I do not do that, um, but. I do think that, yeah, like the idea was just that I have no designated time of writing. I'm just constantly thinking about stuff. And so I think that that is sort of how a lot of people work. Like, do you, do you designate time to write or are you just constantly like trying to figure things out? Definitely the latter, like always, yeah. trying to, always on, but yeah. I know the amount of time it takes to get out the amount of writing I want to get. Like I know like within 60 to 90 minutes I can generate this amount or this yeah. section and that's very comfortable but it's usually still like either the a.m like early in the morning or late at night kind of thing yeah i try to um i mean that was one of the challenges with this book was just that i live with the material i mean i live with the events in the book and sort of like the relationships for so long and uh yeah and like there was no nothing worked for like 20 years in terms there's no way of there's no like optimal way to write the stuff in the book yeah. um until i just sort of like started treating it as like a nine to five and i would just start writing super early in the morning and then just stop writing at 4 p.m and that was the only way i was able to um approach it actually well that kind of leads to another a question inspired by your conversation with Lucy Sant at the uh, Pioneer Works uh, book launch last year. You know, you talked about representing yourself as a character as you did with John earlier and, and the kind of challenges in doing that. And obviously the challenge of time as well as just constructing that, you know, moving ahead, you know, I, I know that there's another project that you're working on uh, where that's due with your editor and stuff like that. Like just moving forward, in addition to like your work, like recently with the New Yorker, like your piece about Randall Park, you know, just like, how is you, the character, kind of evolving through your writing? Are you able to kind of compartmentalize it with your ongoing work with The New Yorker and other journalism, or is it kind of informing it in a different way? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think I, uh, it's been really meaningful because I feel like I, turning oneself into a character is just, it's just fine but turning your friends or people you care about into characters is a bit thornier. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know, like I found that that whole aspect of it to be very, uh, I don't know, like unnerving, kind of weird. I don't really want to do it again. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I am like, we are all always characters in some way, right? Like not just people who are writers, but we're always, uh, when we're outward, when we're sort of external facing, we're always performing to some extent. And so, uh, yeah, to that extent, when I'm writing for the New Yorker, I'm like performing a character who is like an expert at something or who has a lot of authority. Uh, I don't necessarily, I mean, this could change, but I don't really want to write about myself anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. This was just the, the thing I needed to do and wanted to do, felt compelled to do for quite a while. And I don't necessarily think I have, uh, yeah, I don't know, like it, so it's been sort of interesting to think about this question you're posing of like, what, what, what else, what, what, what next? Uh, because I don't, 
necessarily feel comfortable doing it again. Yeah. Even no. though we are always characters in some extent. So it's it's a matter of degrees as well. Like the, the, yeah. the, the investment they're in, you know. And um, I think writing, I think like all writing, I, I mean I think just writing the conventions of writing gradually shift as well. And so I think as readers and as writers now, everyone is more aware that every writer, every author is present in a piece in a way that like may not have seemed intuitive to people in the 50s or the 80s or even the early 2000s. And so, you know, even at the New Yorker, I feel like I can write myself into a piece, not to disclose something about myself, but just as like this perspective to say like, I'm, I'm, this is how I see things. And to make that more discreet is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're now allowed to like make that viewpoint more discreet. Because when I started writing in the early 2000s, if you had anything that felt first person, it would just get cut. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think now it's, it's clearly always going to inform my perspective on things because it is my perspective, but I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine writing another memoir, basically. Yeah. And my last question before uh, I kind of dip out into the curtain again. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, by the way. I really appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. This is amazing. Like, thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, this is a great conversation to be a part of. Just so much uh, more brighter and optimistic where you are now. The, <laughs> the, like, the, 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 sun, the sun descends here. So <laughs> Yeah, we're, uh, we're cresting downward from 103 today in Sacramento. Yeah. But uh, it, do you want to talk about any ideas for your next project? I know we're like, we should very much celebrate this work that deserves celebration. Um, but like, do you have any ideas of what that? No, that's fine. No ideas. <laughs> that's great. Not really. Yeah. No. <laughs> that's cool. Thought I'd ask. Um, well, I'm going to dip out for a bit. Um, John's going to come back on, but uh, I'll see you guys in a little bit. Hey, Jose. Thank you, Jose. And um, speaking of uh, next projects, uh, thank you, uh, Wow, for that live fact check. Interstate is out. Um, it was published uh, in 2021 and uh, chipped um, Jose's uh, memoir about skateboarding and uh, space, um, among other things, uh, is coming out in 24, um, in April. Uh, I, I want to circle back to some issues that just came up while in your conversation and which are being brought up in, in the audience. I'm going to try to collapse a few questions together because there are a lot of questions. Um, several of them to do with um, sort of how you think generationally. Do you, did you always want to write a kind of Gen X memoir? Is being the forgotten generation at all part of of this book? And and I'll lump on there one more thing, which is there, there's so much obsolete technology in this book. <laughs> um, it, it is like a True. celebration. Yeah. Of, of all these different ways that we used to listen, record, and how w without our digital things, um, experience was different. It just was. And I wonder if you can talk about perhaps those two things together, like the, how different the experience of experience was for Gen X people and how that relates to, I don't know, um, how young people are today. You've taught at Vassar, you're now at Bard. Do you ever have a, a long gap in presenting to students, you know, what experience is like? Again, I think this was a question that I, I found really meaningful to try and puzzle with as I was writing, because I think, um, I, I mean, I think when I, when I revisited college or just sort of like this period of time, I mean, obviously like very, very, traumatic things happen in the book but a lot of there's a lot of boredom too there's a lot of just kind of looking for the next parking lot to hang out in looking for the next place to walk to to get something to eat and I think what I needed to figure out how to do in order to write the book because uh, you know I in some ways I began writing portions that end up in the book in like 1998 uh, when I'm 21 but what happens in the interim is the whole concept of boredom or free time changes. You know, all of a sudden, uh, 
10 years after the events in the book, like the iPhone comes out, like the internet was not really a thing the, the way it is now uh, when I was in college. And so it was this question of like how to communicate this different experience of time and different experience of boredom, different like contours of the day without valorizing it or without saying like, yeah, it was like so much better when we only had like 10 CDs per person, you know? <laughs> Like there, you could argue that it was better back then, but I was like uninterested in making that argument, but I wanted people to understand why as like a 20 year old, I thought like, wow, life couldn't get any better. Like I could go buy this like imported CD for $25. Um, so that was a challenge was just to figure out how to like build that world. And again, I mean, I'm sure like novelists, short story writers are constantly doing this and I think one thing after having written this, I just am even more in awe of like poets, short story writers, novelists, people who are able to actually kind of create these fictional worlds that feel very lived in because it took me so long to figure out how to do that for my own life, you know, and for this experience of, I don't know if like, I guess technically I'm Gen X. Um, it's weird though, because I remember when like Kurt Cobain and River Phoenix and like people who are much older than me at the time all passed away. There was like, they were also Gen X. So I feel like generational categories were just much broader then because, you know, but yeah, I mean, I guess this was this, I guess my perspective generationally is as someone who didn't grow up with technology, but also like is now like fully immersed in technology and like comfortable in it. So I just wanted to be able to explain what like, the hours of four to 6 p.m. were like during this period of time when there was like nothing else to do. Um, yeah, you have that great line. Soon people would lose their relationships to something called free time. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very weird. I, I was just talking to someone about how uh, like I flew a lot as a kid because my father lived in Taiwan and, you know, it's like a 12 hour flight, however long. And I would just be in fear of not having anything to do. So I would bring like four Tom Clancy novels or just, you know, like an entire like, sh like grocery bag full of AA batteries because, you know, there's just, there are only so many things you could do or there are only so many devices you could use at that time. And so um, it is very foreign to think about now, but um, this is sort of like how stress was calibrated for a 13 year old in 1990. <laughs> Uh, Kamiko Guthrie has a has a question about um, since we've been talking about frames, you know, time frame, friendship as a frame, technology as a frame within a frame, generations as a frame. Um, there's also philosophies of friendship um, and exchange, and and what binds us together um, throughout the book. Um, and she says you include philosophies about relationship and gift exchange, Derrida and others, which gave the deeply personal aspects of the memoir, a satisfying frame and organizing lens. Did you organize your writing around this philosophy at all, or did it just emerge as you wrote, or was it something you included later as a way to organize and focus? That's a great question. And there's, I guess there's like two answers to that. One is, I think, um, you know, when, when one is experiencing, it's sort of like, so much so much about like music or culture or film it's like we're learning how to feel like a before we experience love we hear love songs and and you realize like oh this is like a like an ecstatic high that i hope to some someday feel uh i think when when one's really sad like or just sort of like going through i mean there're just there's these certain emotions that aren't necessarily as present in in music or songs or or movies so like i think i was just really obsessed with thinking about friendship or thinking about grief and seeing how it had been modeled in the culture artistically and so anything involving friendship i would just read for, for a few years because i just wanted to get some insight into these like dynamics that we take for granted because we all experience it positively or negatively and so on one hand it was like there's this archive of like 
things about friendship that, I, that I've been reading. And it struck me as weird that there aren't that many like songs just about friendship. There's so many songs about love. But then when you think about it, like most songs are like enactments of friendship because it's like people who start a band together or people who are working together. The second part of the answer is that a lot of those references to like Derrida or Aristotle, um, they occur at, at points in the book where the character of me or like actually me is very infatuated with the idea of being like this erudite intellectual like name dropper. And so there is like an aspect of it where it's serious because I think some of what Derrida wrote about friendship is like, like very penetrating and very uh, like so perceptive and so moving but it gets a lot of that is occurring in the first half of the book where the character is like yeah like of course this guy wouldn't talk about friendship directly he would cite Derrida you know <laughs> or like of course this person would would try and always bring in these other references in order to explain something that an elemental is like quite elemental um, so that's sort of where these different, how some of those references were meant to work. You mentioned before, and I quoted from the book that you, you were sort of an againster. You were, you were sort of <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> you you love to explain things by what was what was bad or, or what wasn't up to snuff, and obviously, then you develop a really close relationship with a guy who loves Dave Matthews, and you have to reassess that that sort of format of living, but. I kind of feel like the book is also a story of migrating that to different forms of engagement. And so in the book, you also talk about volunteering for Black Panther. You you teach um, underserved um, kids in Richmond. And it's like your your cultural assessment of being against things is redirected. That energy is redirected towards forms of being against other injustices and i i wonder if that evolution was um something that you discovered in the course of writing this book or if it's something that you knew even then that it was happening i think even then i was just looking for community and it just so happened that the communities the sort of like ready-made communities of moving moving into a dorm like everyone who's into this team hangs out here everyone who majors in this is over here, like those kind of forms of community seemed really rickety to me. Like uh, the fact that we all like went to high school in the same city, like that's not really a form of community. But then uh, I thought the community was like people who are into the same like seven bands that I loved. And then I think as I kind of went through college and happens to a lot of people, I think I just thought about community in a maybe in a more political way or you know, in a more, uh, in, in a sort of like pursuit of solidarity way. And so I think that impulse was always there. I wasn't against her, but I was always, I was also like a desperate joiner. I just never found the, the sort of communities I wanted to join until like a little bit later. Mm. But I think, I th and I think that's actually why Ken was like, tolerated me to an extent um, because he sort of saw through a lot of my cynicism as actually an expression of like, like very sincere yearning that I was just like, and again, I mean, I don't think this is like unique to me by any stretch, but I think a lot of the ways in which I projected myself was actually like, like, Hey, notice me but like notice me for the reasons I want to be noticed. And, um, you know, he, he sort of like immediately saw that and then saw past it and then tried to like, you know, understand me. Um, and then yeah. later I, him. So. And, uh, it's, it's a lovely moment when you become friends simply by giving him dressing advice. And, and I, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, which, uh, I think to, for those who haven't read the book, you know, uh, this, Point, I would say you, you thrifted most of your clothes. You wore a lot of not natural fibers and cardigans. Um, yes. <laughs> inappropriately hot weather, uh, yeah. clothes, hot weather. Uh, um, and I, I, I wonder if you could say anything about, I mean, I'm, 
try not to give away the one of the core parts of the book, but I, there is a before and after in the book. The book is about grief, and you know, there's there's a lot of things that you're kind of saying goodbye to in the course of the book, but you're also holding on to certain things. And the second half of the book, you describe leaving Berkeley and going to Harvard and becoming, you know, the, the, the public intellectual in a way that you, you are, but you're still carrying all these fragments with you. You see a mental health counselor. And is there anything that you, you think is worth saying about the, the difference between how you grieved with your friends on campus and then how you grieved alone that was, was, was necessary to write or was difficult to write or unexpected? Yeah, it was- uh yeah it was very it was very difficult to write because i think it forced me to and again i don't i don't really know what level of spoilers this book operates at but uh yeah i mean there's there's an extent there's a way in which um when something traumatic happens to a group of people like that's a community like that's that you'll never forget and i still have like incredibly intense relationships with like I don't know like 85 percent of the people in the book but um eventually you all sort of like have to figure out your own paths forward you know after the initial shock of trauma subsides like and I think I really sort of walled myself off right I just kind of um didn't know how to um grieve with other people because again like it probably there's probably a sense of like singularity that i felt like i was i was like giving up and so uh it was very odd and difficult to revisit that because i felt so uh i felt so much i don't want to say shame but i felt like man like you really should have just not taken you, you really should have just like sought out community or like leaned on your friends or like not taking yourself so seriously in these moments when I just felt very like uh you know like upset and haunted and 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 just kind of not functional so yeah it was like very strange to revisit that and to sort of understand why for a period of time like my friends and I just sort of like drifted apart and then sort of like how in the process of writing, I think I kind of understood a bit more about what it was I was avoiding and what, uh, what it was I needed. That makes sense. Oh, absolutely. It's a beautiful description of, I mean, there's a lot of comments floating in, um, you know, about the, the, the mess of grief and how it sort of, um, it lies dormant and then comes back and you're grieving alone and sometimes you're with others. And um, I think one of the reasons this book strikes such a chord is is you manage it to portray a very singular experience to you in, in all of its varieties. Um, also with a, an, an incredibly beautiful description of uh, male friendship, um, which is so... Uh, uncommon sadly to some degree in in literature um Derek Lewis jumped back in and say it's rare to read about a male friendship in such a transparent manner um I, I would love to bring um Jose back in for just one or two more questions before we run out of time here um since Jose has also just recently completed a, a memoir and essays um skateboarding can seem like a very singular activity is, is there any part of you, your work jose that's that's coming um that you can talk about in relation to um Wa's book and how it uh, describes the kind of fractal nature of groups and friends how you join and sort of peel off into different groups and and experience different things collectively and then suddenly singularly as a skateboarder because it seems like space if you're going to be writing about space emotional space is a form of space yeah for sure i mean i think in interstate um there's a not so much skateboarders but kind of skater aligned people like folks that go to the same dive bar so to speak i lived with and uh 
14th and Jackson is an intersection in o downtown Oakland and the essay is named after it. And it's kind of about finding this community in this post-collegiate ennui kind of time. Um, but in actually the latest Alta, which is a massive plug, is uh, there's an article about a skate convention that happened this year in Arizona called Slow Impact, um, a nice pun for the old uh, skater heads of the world. But it was basically, you know, this kind of drop the pin moment where one pro skater from Tempe, Arizona, Ryan Lay, invited skaters from basically on Twitter and Instagram to come to this new skate park that they helped build through this nonprofit skate after school. And there was like some light programming through the day. There was panels, you know, skaters talking about gender equity and everything from uh, pay parity for women in the Olympics. I actually read at Ryan's house with some other skaters who write. So, you know, that community is, is kind of ever present amidst this isolated act. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting finding kinship um, through these acts, uh, <clears throat> as well as like music and things like that, that wah describes as well but um yeah thanks for that question yeah no I, i'm curious why if, if um if you're sorry i'm gonna get this wrong but the what was it straight edge hardcore punk aesthetic <laughs> have you have you received love letters from, from people from that that subculture no not 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 really because i think much like i think a lot of um my teen years was just kind of trying on different identities for, and then just sort of moving on. And so I don't think I was ever very uh, committed to in any like principled way to being like straight edge, even though it was just like much like being into eggplant. It was just sort of like this affectation that I adopted um, for a little bit of time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I really love about Jose's essays, and it sort of relates to what we're talking about, is that I think when you're in in this in like a scene or like in a subculture you just sort of randomly cross paths with people and it's not really friendship it's not like you're just acquaintances but you just experience these things together um whether you just sort of like meet up with some people when you're skating whether you're just like kind of walking around campus going from party to party and you just sort of like merge with some group and i think that that's just like a form of like a it's like a form it's like a type of relationship that's sort of hard to describe but it's something that i think it's much it's much harder to find that sometimes especially nowadays when we don't really have as many opportunities just kind of like be in space and not know where we are you know or or just to be searching for something um, with a group of people um, and that's something that jose writes about really well in, in some of his essays and it's also something that I think about a lot because so much of writing is like this completely asymmetrical relationship where like I remember so much about random people um, that and they become characters in like the fictions of my life. Um, but then like people remember me, you know, and, and it's just sort of like um, or, or they don't. And it's just sort of like an interesting relationship that you sort of have the opportunity to explore when you're writing these sorts of personal essays. Um, but yeah, that's, that's. God, 25 years of work putting this together. Um, you describe in the second half of the book that fragments are, are coming to you. Um, uh, I, I hope Jose, you're, it, you, it would be impossible looking at you, but it's possible that your either of your books took you that long. Um, I hope your third book doesn't <laughs> take you that long. You know, one of the things that the question that came up, and it's probably the last one we'll be able to, to address, which is about, and this is a wonky one, but I'll try to bring it back to experience, which is how how do you structure a book like this so that it feels like experience, and yet it works um, dramatically? And you know, Jose, you've just recently completed that, so have a crack at it yourself. I think that's one of the things that that is so admired about stay true it's just that you've managed to pull that off and I, there have been a lot of questions in the audience about how you did that um and jose is is there a thing that you do to keep experience feeling as disruptive and circular and sort of um ongoing when you are writing that you try to do 
Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take a crack first. And, um, you know, like, I feel like staying present in the moment, you know, to kind of speak broadly about that, I think you, you have to remember the impetus to write the piece to begin with, you know, what, whether it was ephemera or a moment or a, a certain trigger, you know, in the world that made you think about something. For instance, a lot of this book, Chipped, is about a friend, not directly, but seeing kind of versions of himself out as an adult is, is very weird. Um, so yeah, I think like staying present in the moment of a certain song, like I know sometimes I would write with music that inspired certain essays or and sometimes I would write in like total silence to just be present with my thoughts and try and be in that memory as much as possible. But I think a big thing for me was not only recognizing what happened, like the five W's of that moment, but the energy of it, like what was the inertia of that moment? What, what was the kind of tension? And I think trying to stay true to that emotional, emotional core of the memory or the moment um, is key for me. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with that idea of like the, uh, the, um, it's like the aura of the moment trying to describe it. Um, I don't, I don't, I have no idea how, I mean, I, my book is sort of circular in structure in that certain things, it sort of can be read straight through. But then when you get to the last, this isn't a spoiler or anything, but as you approach the end, I think there's context as to why it was structured that way leading up, if that makes sense. And I didn't intend for it to be that way. Um, I really have to credit my editor, uh, Thomas Kabermadine at Doubleday and my agent, uh, Chris Paris Lamb. Like they, they had a lot of really great um, suggestions about kind of like taking stuff out or moving stuff around. Um, but a lot of it just sort of happened in this weird serendipitous way where I would be writing something later in the book and I would realize like, oh, if for this to really work, like this has to be over here, you know, and then just sort of like figuring out the spacing for different things was really new for me. But um, yeah, I mean, and, and for me, I think like staying present in the moment, but also kind of toggling back and forth in perspective so that the reader kind of understands that there's like a retrospective perspective here to, that, that, that like when I'm saying back then is clearly from someone who's like much older looking back but not necessarily revealing who that person is, but, but just allowing that so that the reader understands that there's like a haziness to these memories or that there's something about these memories that aren't necessarily, um, it's not history, it's memory and just sort of like seeding these ideas along the way. So uh, yeah, a lot of it was just about like figuring out like where something would go and then oftentimes realizing that I had sort of like planted something earlier, but then sort of making sure that those connections would, would work out. But, uh, you know, for the reader to just be able to read along, but then also to have their own moments of like, huh, like, I, is this, is this correct? Like, is this, uh, should I, I don't know how to feel about this memory or, or things like that. I don't know if that makes any sense. That makes, that makes so much sense. Um, and the, the way that certain, um, notes come back, uh, like the Beach Boys song. Yeah. Um, uh, it creates a kind of um, a, a mysterious soundscape um, that is operating on the reader in the way that experience operates on us because it's not planned and we don't design it. Um, and so we're always trying to figure out what it means. Um, we've run 10 minutes over and I could keep talking to both of you um, for quite a while. Um, it's been such a pleasure and congratulations um, on the Pulitzer. Annie, um, Annie Tan um, says that as do I think quite a few people in the, in the chat. Um, Stay True is just a beautiful book. Um, it, it's such a, such a welcome update to the, the story of male friendship. Um, from Dharma Bums. I know there have been other books in between, but um, as a sort of East Bay friendship um, uh, text, I think it's it's going to be around for a long time for many other reasons too. And Jose, congrats on your upcoming book. Um, 
this has been a wonderful night. Um, David, I think you're lurking there to, to take us out. Um, <clears throat> I am. I am. That was a fantastic conversation. Thank you. To, thank you to all three of you. Um, I'll, uh, I just need to find my text. So um, thank you to all, all three of you. Uh, thank you to Wa and Jose and John. For, uh, for those uh, interested, this interview was recorded and will be available at CaliforniaBookClub.com. Uh, don't forget, next month's book is Clark and Division by Naomi Hirahara. Uh, and also don't forget about the Alta membership at AltaOnline.com slash join. Uh, or again, the $3 digital membership, and please participate in a two-minute survey that will pop up as soon as the event ends. Take care, everybody. Stay safe, and we'll see you all next month. Have a good night.